open the second meeting of the Public Audit Committee and move straight to item one. Item one is the decision to take uh, business items in private. That's items four, five and six. Can I ask the committee to agree to take these items in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. I'd like to move now to item two, which is the uh, section 23 report on the Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme, um, an update. And we will take uh, evidence from, uh, from Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for, for Scotland, and from Mark Taylor, Assistant Director, Gemma Diamond, Senior Manager, and Morag Campsey, Project Manager. Can I welcome you all very warmly uh, to the committee meeting this morning. The Auditor General for Scotland and Audit Scotland advised in advance of this session that they may be unable to respond fully to questions on the conflict of interest identified in the report regarding IT programme governance, as this matter is currently under police investigation. Investigation. Now, the AGS will be able to clarify what she can and can't say uh, to the committee in her opening statement. Can I now invite the Auditor General for Scotland to make her opening statement before I open up to questions from members? I'm very pleased to be back reporting to the committee in this new session. Obviously, a lot's happened in the last week, and however events unfold, the committee's role in scrutinising the public finances will be even more important in this Parliament. Big changes are already underway with the Parliament's new financial powers, and these are sure to be high on the agenda for the Public Audit Committee and for Audit Scotland in the months to come. I'm looking forward to building on the excellent work carried out, carried out by the Committee in the last session and continuing to support members in their role. Convener, the first report in front of you today looks at the progress the Scottish Government has made with its Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme. This is my fourth update on the programme, and it covers progress up to April this year. Before I outline my findings, it might be useful to reflect briefly on the result of last week's EU referendum. I recognise that there may be implications for the programme, but it's too early to know what the impact might be. We'll continue to keep a close eye on developments over the coming months, and we'll consider carefully the implications for our audit work. These developments, though, don't detract from the need for the Scottish Government to stay focused on making payments to farmers, crofters and rural businesses as quickly and effectively as possible both to mitigate the impact on rural businesses and to learn lessons from how the Futures Programme has been managed to date. The programme's IT system is central to this, intended to process, validate and make payments to farmers. The system is in place and it is operating, but it hasn't worked as well as it needs to, and some parts of the system are still being developed and redesigned. I do want to acknowledge at this stage the continuing commitment of Scottish Government staff to delivering the programme, which is truly commendable. I'm concerned that this level of effort is not sustainable, though, and there is a real risk of burnout. Convener, I'll briefly summarise the key points in the report. First of all, a number of milestones and ministerial targets for making payments to farmers have been missed. Farmers report that payment delays have affected their cash flow, with a knock-on effect on the rural economy. The Scottish Government announced three loan schemes to get some money to farmers more quickly, paid from the Scottish Government budget. But in spite of this, some farmers had not received a payment by April 2016, when they would normally expect to have received a payment in December. I reported in April that the Scottish Government was unlikely to meet the June deadline and could incur financial penalties as a result. Since then, the EC has moved the deadline for payments from the end of June to the 15th of October this year. A later payment date puts back the immediate risk of financial penalties, but the underlying concerns about the programme remain. I highlight in my report that estimating the potential financial penalties is difficult, and it's ultimately subject to assessment by EC auditors. This assessment is wider than the number of payments made by the deadline. It also includes the quality of the checks and other controls in place before payments were made. Our report highlights that there is a risk of disallowance arising from delays and also from the workarounds that the teams have put in place to enable them to make payments. Second, the complexity of the programme. There's no doubt that the external environment for this programme is challenging. The EC regulations are complex and they've been clarified and developed over the life of the programme. At the same time, decisions that the government has made in discussion with the farming industry on how the cap is designed and delivered in Scotland have added to this complexity. 
Third, on decision-making and governance, we identify some occasions when significant decisions were made out with the programme governance structures. The programme program board was not given the opportunity to fulfil its role in offering advice and support to the programme sponsor. We also identified occasions when decisions took too long, affecting programme delivery. The IT team and the programme team didn't work well together, and basic information on delivery and timescales wasn't shared with those managing the programme. This led to a lack of trust between the two teams and affected delivery. Finally, convener, as you referred to, there was a significant conflict of interest which was not dealt with effectively. The delivery director, who was a contractor, was able to benefit financially from rec recruitment decisions. I should note for the record that a police investigation is underway. The Scottish Government put arrangements in place to ensure that decisions were not taken by a single individual, but the delivery director still had the opportunity to influence decisions as a senior member of the resources group. Overall, the programme won't deliver the full range of planned benefits, and the gov government now aims only to deliver a system that complies with EC regulations without some of the planned enhancements. There's also a risk that the current programme budget will be exhausted before a CAP compliance system is delivered. I don't expect the programme to deliver value for money. The report contains a number of recommendations, many of which I've made before in relation to the management of IT programmes. The government, first of all, needs to get the IT system working more effectively, as I know it's committed to doing. It needs to complete a detailed assessment of the risk of financial penalties for all of the remaining elements to enable informed decisions about priorities and to manage the remaining budget. It also needs to ensure that appropriate governance arrangements are in place, together with plans for disaster recovery and knowledge transfer. Convener, I have with me the colleagues who have prepared this report on my behalf and the previous ones, and we're obviously happy to do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much indeed, Auditor General. Um, I'm going to open up to members' questions now. Can members please indicate to me if they would like to ask a question on this topic? And I'm going to start with Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Auditor General. Um, I have a certain feeling of deja vu looking at this report. We've had several in the past on this particular issue. It seems to reflect the, uh, the overall problems with IT procurement throughout the public sector. And it doesn't seem to be restricted to Scotland either because we've seen fairly large uh, uh, problems with IT most, most uh, recently, I think, with HMRC, weren't they? Two or three billion pounds they wrote off in their, in their system down south but you're absolutely right that this is not a problem that's confined to the Scottish Government. And we've also, we've also discussed previously the difficulties with uh, skill shortages in the market uh, and the difficulty of, for the public sector in competing with the private sector and buying in those skills that are available. So we have a critical problem which is multiplied by what's happening outside as well. I notice that on page 6, uh, under recommendations, just under the six bullet points, you do say you found common themes and weaknesses in the management of ICT programmes in the public sector. I think it's going to be very important when you produce that summary, presumably that will come forward to this committee. It, it certainly will, Mr Beattie. Um, as you say, this is by no means the first report um, on serious problems with major IT systems that I've made, um, and we, we expect there to be more in future. Um, we are looking at both the whether we can take the recommendations we've made previously further in terms of making them more specific or more helpful, and how we can add value in other ways. Gemma might want to say a little bit more about that and about how we bring it back to this committee. Certainly. We're keep, certainly keeping a very close eye on developments within the Scottish Government. Obviously, they appeared before the committee in the last session um, on the back of our um, update report on managing ICT contracts, talking about the arrangements they were starting to put in place to try and help with the skills um, issue. For example, putting in a kind of centralised digital transformation service, which would have that kind of central hub of skilled people that could go out to central government bodies who couldn't get the skills themselves or help them to recruit. And we're certainly keeping a very close eye on that. Um, as Caroline said, we're also thinking ourselves about other ways where we can try um, and be helpful. We're looking at those common themes and trying to see if actually we can um, provide more detail or more specific questions, for example, and potentially to board members, so questions they can ask when they see um, programme papers for scrutiny and the kind of information they might expect to receive. So we're looking at different options to see where, actually, as we keep on repeating the same recommendations, how can we break it down and make it more helpful and to try and help people to understand what the key issues are. 
Obviously, in the, in, within this report, there's, there's things that we'll want to follow up, but I do think, Convener, maybe we need to look at the overall picture as well going forward, and perhaps when the Auditor General's report comes forward, we can maybe have a, have a thought about how to do that. It is a big issue, and, you know, I don't know whether any uh, administration has been very good at, uh, at uh, identifying the problems and dealing with these problems, but maybe there's something we can learn from elsewhere. And when the report comes forward, if you can... Uh, helpfully suggest where there's been good practice elsewhere in the public sector managing the IT projects, maybe we can, we can take that into view as well. But I'm, I'm concerned about what you're saying about uh, uh, in your report about lack of trust, blame culture, hindering effective progress, little accountability, ineffective challenge and oversight. We've heard this before. I mean, why? We had reports previously which were uncomfortable. Now this report seems to be the sort of nuclear option. How did it suddenly get to that point? I think um, the team and I have reflected on this, and our view is that it didn't suddenly reach this point, that actually the seeds of the problem were laid back in 2012 when the original business case was put together. Um, I think at that point there wasn't a recognition in the business case of the scale of the challenge um, that, was, um, th that they were facing and of the particular challenge that came from not knowing all of the requirements from the EC at that stage. Um, th that was known, but it wasn't recorded in the business case, and it wasn't um, built into the thinking about, therefore, how it needed to be planned and managed. There was also, as we say in the report, a significant delay in appointing the key senior people who needed to be there to procure, to develop the options, to procure the system, to put the groundwork in place. And I think all of that meant that when we reached the point where the system needed to be operating to accept applications and start processing payments, it was behind the scene and people were behind the pace and people were very much focused on solving the immediate problems. We think the roots of that were right back at the beginning of the programme. And in a sense, that's a frustration that um, that's very often the case, that it's the, in the, the initial groundwork that's not done well enough that leads to late problems um, in terms of delivery and an impact on the people who rely on the system across Scotland. So the previous Public Audit Committee obviously received reports on this from yourself. These seem to indicate that it was an uncomfortable situation, it was a bit tight, resources were being put in, and that it should be okay, and now it's not. I think people have been doing their absolute best to recover the situation. We know that people have been working very long hours, that extra resources have been brought in. You can see that in some of the exhibits in the graph, in the number of contractors working on the programme. There's no doubt that people were doing their best to um, deliver it. At the same time, I think that pressure to, to make it right led to some of the other problems. So... Um, uh, decisions being made out with the programme governance structures, the programme board not being given its place to think through the other implications of decisions, for example, to make partial payments to farmers or to set up the loan schemes. All of those were done for very understandable reasons, but they all, they all added to this sense of tension and pressure between the two teams, um, the lack of trust and the, the lack of focus on the bigger picture as opposed to the immediate day-to-day -day decisions that were being taken. I mean, apart from the, the, the fact that farmers haven't received their payments on time. There's also this question of disallowance. Now, on page 10, paragraph 10, you mentioned that the Scottish Government's inquired about 69 million, pound, uh, 69 million euros in disallowance uh, over a period, 1% of the total cap payments. Is that in line with what other countries I'll ask Mark experience? to um, answer that question for you, Mr Beattie. I think the existence of disallowance, Mr Beattie, across other countries is not unusual. I think the rates of disallowance across Europe have varied quite significantly. In relation to the previous disallowance, £51 million, uh, pounds we quote, uh, that was for a variety of factors which were related to uh, the, the information that the Scottish Government had available about land, farms uh, and uh, the individual fields and the features in the fields and some issues around uh, the quality of the inspection process and also uh, wider control weaknesses about checks on uh, eligibility. I think the line to be drawn between that and the issue that we face at the moment is it's an indication that when it comes to those sorts of matters, those sorts of matters that are also potentially evident in the current system that the European Commission is quite robust in, 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 in pursuing disallowance and challenging uh, the government to make sure it has the controls that it expects to have in place in place. And I think one of the things we flagged in the report is really that there is 
still a risk of disallowance, not just related to the deadlines uh, uh, around June and now October, but generally the way in which the system has operated and the robustness of the checking that it's been able to facilitate. What are, what are the implications on page 12, para 3, what are the implications that the programme will end when the budget is fully used? Does that mean if it's not finished, we just stop? Um, at the moment, the government has, has made a commitment that it intends to deliver um, a cap-compliant programme um, within that, the existing £178 million budget. We think, as we've reported, that there is a risk the budget won't be sufficient to deliver that full programme. Um, and I guess it's then a decision for the government about um, what it intends to do at that point. Um, my expectation is that it will need to continue to invest in delivering at least a cap-compliant project um, even if it decides not to take forward the other enhancements that are now outside the scope of this programme, and that money would need to be found from elsewhere within the Scottish Government's budget. I'd like to bring in um, a couple of other sure. members. Do you have any further questions? I can come back to you if, if time Perhaps allows. I'll come back later. Okay. Um, I'm going to take uh, Alec Neil. Can I just follow up? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, can I just follow up on that last point, the Auditor General? Um, when you're saying that it might be required to finish this programme to bring money from other parts of the Scottish Government budget, what is your estimate, and do you have an estimate at this stage, of potentially how much additional money from elsewhere are we talking about? We, we don't have an estimate of that, Mr Neil. Um, and at the moment, the government's um, commitment is that it will deliver a cap compliance system within the £178 million budget. If you look at paragraphs 38 to 40 on page 19 of the report, um, you'll see that um, at the time I reported, there was £46.8 million worth of the budget remaining. Of that, £31 million was already committed to things that need to be in place, like the land mapping system, to, to deliver a system that's compliant with the EU regulations. That leaves £15.7 million available for all of the other things that are needed to get it um, fully operating and operating in a way that's quicker and more effective, both for the staff involved and for farmers and their agents. Um, now, my finding is that the £15.7 million is, is tight for that, given the rate of spend that's happening at the moment. Um, I don't have an estimate estimate of what else might be needed because it's the government's plans we're looking at at the moment, but I, but I think there's a risk that 15.7 million is not sufficient. At what point will we be able to establish what additional money will we require from other budgets in order to complete the job? My estimate is that the £15.7 million will be exhausted by November at the existing rate of spend. Um, obviously, it's possible that the system may be complete and fully compliant before then. We're watching this closely through um, the audit process, the audit work that's going on. Mark is also the auditor of the Scottish Government's budget and will be able to give an update on progress when he reports on the Scottish Government's budget through me in September of this year. September we will have an idea of the order of magnitude of the additional money that might be required? I, I would hope so. Okay. Uh, the second point is, in the light of last week's events, um, where we're now involved, uh, are about to become involved in an up to two year negotiation uh, in terms of uh, the UK leaving uh, the EU. <coughs> I know it's early days, but very clearly this project potentially could be affected quite soon uh, in terms of um, if we do leave the EU very clearly, the common agricultural policy as is presumably will not apply to the UK. So are you going to look at, um, I mean, if we're going to spend all this extra money, um, is it extra money that in two years' time for something that we won't need and will be entirely redundant, potentially? I think that's a really difficult question for anybody to answer. Um, clearly, um, the um, outcome of the EU referendum does cast a doubt across this stream of EU funding and other EU funding into Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, as you also say, um, nobody knows exactly what shape that might take or over what time scale. We do know that for at least the next two years, 
the, the UK will remain part of the European Union and therefore this funding will be available to Scotland. In order to access that funding, the government needs to have a system that's compliant with EU requirements for paying it. So I think there is no alternative but to complete the system. Um, and I, I imagine the government will be th doing that with an eye to what it might need in a range of different scenarios in future for providing support to the rural economy. But it's a very difficult situation. I absolutely acknowledge that. And is it one you'll be keeping under constant review? Yes, like everybody else since Friday, we've been thinking within Audit Scotland about um, the implications of the referendum result for, for this and for the Scottish public finances much more widely. Um, we are working on a briefing on other sources of EU funding that come into Scotland um, because obviously this is a significant source but by no means the only one um, and thinking through what that means for our audit work and how we support the Parliament in making decisions over the years ahead. Okay. And finally, can I just come back to following up some of uh, the answers you gave to Colin on project management. Can I make a couple of observations? First of all, um, can I point out that our management of IT projects under successive governments, both in London and in Edinburgh, has been problematic. Um, and I compare that as a former procurement minister to the very successful procurement projects we've done, I mean, most noticeably the new uh, Queensbury Bridge, which is over a billion pounds. It's, you know, more than five times, six times the cost of this particular IT project. And, you know, in comparison, we've had very few problems uh, with that massive engineering project. And yet with a project that's like a, a fifth or a sixth of the size, we get into all of these kind of difficulties. So have we not maybe lessons to learn about project management from non-IT projects, uh, which were under the management directly of the Scottish Futures Trust, for example, where the procurement and the project management have run much more smoothly, very often well under budget, and certainly uh, being finished on time and, and to the original spec compared to the IT projects? Did we, do we not need to have a, a broader canvas uh, on how we manage future IT projects so we don't end up in this mess in future? Would be my first question. And my second question is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the problems in this program weren't highlighted to the Cabinet until something like October last year. Now, is there not something fundamentally wrong when the civil service and the project managers are not highlighting uh, and flagging up difficulties the minute they arise in a project of this size? And should we not put some fairly urgent procedures in place to make sure we don't have a repeat of that? Because if ministers had been aware collectively at a much earlier stage of the scale of the problem, then I think then uh, that would have forced perhaps action at a much earlier stage, corrective action, than what actually happened. Because uh, at the end of the day, ministers have to carry, well, is, 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 should we not be doing that? Because at the end of the day, ministers carry the can for other people's incompetence. I'll ask Mark in a moment to pick up the second of your questions, right. Mr Neil. On the first, I think it's a very good point, and actually it replays some of the ground we covered with your predecessors on this committee in the last session, um, where we had looked at another programme where um, it had been very difficult to attract the uh, people of the right skills and the right seniority to manage a, a a um, significant investment in IT um, and actually across Scotland there's a shortage of people with these skills. Um, we did point to the parallel of the Scottish Futures Trust where there's been an investment in building that expertise, bringing the right people together and doing it on a scale that can look across projects across Scotland and we can see an improvement in the way those projects are being managed both to cost and to time. Um, I think there, there was an intention on the part of the Scottish Government in setting up the new Government Digital Service to do exactly that. For us, it's too early yet to see the impact of it, because, as I say, this project started back in 2012, and I think many of the seeds of the problem were actually sown then. Um, it's something we'll be watching very closely, not least because there is the immediate cost um, of systems like this going over budget and not delivering what's intended. There's a much bigger dividend of the potential to um, transform public services by good use of digital, which will help with the financial pressures we're facing ahead. And I think there is, as you say, a wider question of trust in government that we need to get right in, in all of this. I'll ask Mark to pick up the second question about the risk management of the project. Thank you, Auditor General. Uh, we, we highlight uh, uh, in the report, uh, paragraph two on page seven, that 
the, the, the fact that this was a risky project was something that the Scottish Government within Scottish Government officials had identified early on the risk register. In fact, it was in February 2013 where initially this was identified as a risk issue within the Scottish Government. And I guess the question then is, is as things have escalated, what is the appropriate point to bring ministers into that, in, into that discussion? And uh, we've not looked in detail at the mechanics of how that worked and, and indeed whether that was too soon or too early. A couple of points that we do highlight in... So I think one, one, of the, so one of the things that we are very mindful of in our work on the Scottish Government is how the risk management processes work. And as we uh, think about how those risk management processes need to be developed in the new environment, whether it's uh, Brexit or whether it's new financial powers coming to Scotland, one of the things that we'll be very interested in is how those uh, work more generally and the, the relationship between those processes and ministerial involvement. Okay. Thank you. Can you okay. Alison. Good morning. I hear what you're saying and acknowledge, obviously, where we are with the budget that was est well, estimated where you are with that budget, what's left with the spend of that budget. What just immediately came to my attention was obviously the range of potential financial penalties. Now, obviously, we all agree between 40 million and 125 million is significant and very material. I would like to ask what is being done to ensure that we're keeping that at the smaller end of penalties? because I think it's a fair assumption that penalties will come into play. Um, first of all, I, I think um, we, we have assessed the potential penalties. There is still a possibility there may be no penalties, particularly with the extension of the payment deadline, um, and I don't want to prejudge that. Um, one of the recommendations I've made in my report, and I think the most important one, um, is the need for the Scottish Government to be stepping back and doing a, real, a really close assessment of which parts of the system are complying with the EU's requirements and which are not, and to use that information to prioritise um, the spending of the remaining budget that's available. Um, they're trying to balance a whole range of things, and I, again, recognise the, the difficulty and the complexity of this, um, but the range of the pen, pen range of potential penalties is wide. They are significant, particularly in this current climate, um, and prioritising the work to minimise the risk, I think, is the most important thing that needs to be done at this point, while continuing to make payments to farmers. Yes. And I'm assuming, who, who actually pays these penalties? I'm assuming it's the government. They would come from the Scottish government's it's overall not being passed budget. On. That's fine to farmers or anything. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, just to follow up on a couple of those points, actually, uh, the point Alison Harris just made, um, quite clearly the emergency loans that have been made wouldn't have been budgeted for. Uh, quite clearly uh, it was not anticipated that there would be fines, so that must not have been budgeted for. So, presumably there's work being done to put a contingency in for if there are fines and at what level. Uh, but is there any indication of where that money is going to come from? I think the, the answer is different um, in looking at the loans from looking at the potential penalties. And I'll ask Mark to, to pick it up initially. Yep, happy to do so. Uh, so in relation to the loans, uh, what the government was able to do was identify that there was scope to uh, make advances to farmers with a view to get, getting that money back from farmers once the, the actual payments have been made and then reuse that money, recycle that money within the current financial year for its original budgeted purposes. And essentially that's from a pot called financial transactions, which are essentially loans from government to private uh, private sector individuals and housing associations and, and uh, bodies outside the public sector with a view to those bodies repaying those amounts back to government in the future. So the risks that we highlight in the report is that that can't happen as soon as it was planned to happen and indeed if the, re the actual payments are made to farmers to enable uh, that actual payments are made to farmers too late to enable that to happen quickly enough that there is a risk that those other loans are delayed. The government has given us an assurance that it's working to make sure it manages that within the, the same financial year and I guess we highlight in the report that there are risks to that and it is contingent on the payment system being in place and the, the final payments being made to farmers to enable, enable those lo loans to be recovered and recycled to their original intended uh, recipients. 
relation to financial penalties, um, there, th I think that the first thing to say is that one of the key elements of the business case for the Futures Programme was to reduce the risk of penalties and disallowance in future. Um, Mr Beatty, I think, referred to the 51 million under the previous programme that had been disallowed. Um, the government had a very clear aim to minimise that in the next programme, the current programme, for very obvious reasons. Um, so at the moment, I think there is no provision for those penalties if they are indeed levied. Um, I would expect that the government is at the moment doing its own assessment of um, how likely penalties might be and what, what the range is, and then looking at how they can be funded. Um, but I would stress that they haven't yet been um, agreed or finalised in terms of the amount. They are still potential penalties. Mm -hmm. um, and just if I may follow up on that, uh, in terms of the loans, uh, so I recollect that uh, Fergus Ewing suggested that there might be interest payable on those loans uh, by the farmers. Do we know if that's correct or not? And if so, does that not seem a little harsh? Uh, I think I think the, de the details of confirmation for, about the government's plans are best to come from government around that. I think one thing I would share is our understanding uh, most recently is that uh, uh, Mr Ewing has indicated that, that, that he is reviewing the, the, the need for those interest payments. Thank you. Can I bring in uh, Monica Lennon, please? Thank you. Keep you Good morning. I just want to pick up on um, the issue around staffing. Um, Auditor General, you said in your evidence that there's a real risk of, of burnout. And I know on page 36 to 37 that, that that is addressed in the report. Um, it's not come as an overnight uh, surprise. There have been warning signals and I note the gateway reviews throughout 2015 highlighted some of these risks. So it's evident that people are working very hard but mistakes are being made and there's a real issue in quality. Um, I, I just wonder to what extent you're concerned that there's scope for further problems in this area. And I note that there's a risk that staff may leave the programme before we, we get to the to the end. And related to that, um, I also note that, that you're recommending in the report that the Scottish Government needs to put plans and processes in place immediately. And that, that's a very clear <laughs> statement, but I just wonder, um, how confident you are that the action is being taken as we speak uh, and what might be a, a reasonable time scale around those transitional plans? I think the first thing to say is that we all recognise this is a very difficult position for the staff involved to be in. Um, I heard Mr Ewing yesterday giving evidence to the Rural Economy Committee um, and recognising both the commitment and the efforts of the staff involved and the risk of errors being made and, and burnout and so on. Um, and there, there clearly isn't an easy answer to that while people are working so hard to get payments made on time and the appropriate controls and checks in place as well. Um, I think, first of all, I'd say that the government's recognition of that risk is an important first step. I think if, if people feel that their efforts are being recognised, um, it, it's easier to keep up that level of commitment for a period than it otherwise would be. Um, I also think that it, the um, immediate short-term efforts going on mustn't get in the way of the importance of really having a plan for transferring knowledge from all the contractor staff who are currently still employed into the Scottish Government staff who will have to run this programme into the future, whether that's the, the um, long-term future um, or a period after the triggering of Article 50. We still need to have a system that can do this, and I think that plan for transferring knowledge is very important. As I say, I do take comfort from the fact that it's recognised at the highest levels in government and it's a, a challenge that all of us completely recognise from managing organisations ourselves. Okay. Do any other members have points they want to... Yes, Colin. Uh, thank you, Vina. Just a, a couple of things I wanted to come in on. Um, General, you, you, you referred to that other pro, pro project presumably NHS 24 and the issues around that. Now, within NHS 24, there were clear evidence of concealment of what the true situation was in terms of that contract. And that was very evident, and that came out in your report. You haven't mentioned anything about concealment here. And yet, uh, as Alec Neil mentioned, the, the Cabinet weren't aware of it until, I think it was October 2015, 
So was there an element of concealment? Was there an element of, uh, you know, we hope it's going to be okay, let's keep it quiet until, uh, until it comes out? As Mark said, the, the risk posed by this programme was included on the Scottish Government's risk register from, from its early days. So it was recognised as being something risky at that point. Um, my uh, strong sense is that the governance problems around the project that I highlight in the report, with the programme board not being able to carry out its full role, with difficulties in getting hold of information about delivery and about timescales and costs, um, the programme board decisions being made around it or decisions being delayed made it much more difficult for the checks and balances you would expect to be in place to work effectively um, and for that clear picture of really how bad is this to be apparent to the programme sponsor and then on through the permanent secretary to ministers. Um, I don't have any evidence of deliberate concealment, um, but I do think that those governance failings made it much more difficult. Gemma said earlier that we were looking at um, whether we can help through things like providing clear guidance to members of audit and risk committees about their role, about the questions they should be asking, about the assurance they should be seeking. I had a session with the Scottish Government's non-executive directors before the election, just as part of our regular contact, and it's clear they were asking the same questions themselves about what should they have known, how far should this have been brought to their attention, how far should they have been questioning what they were being told. I think it, it's a really clear example of why these governance arrangements matter. They're, they're not just a, a tick box exercise, they're the way in which people can understand what progress is being made, what the risks are, and what needs to be escalated in very good time. But there seems to be a serial issue that we don't learn from the last disaster. I mean, here we are again here. We're looking at uh, the, the people running this project in your page 27, paragraph 77, relied on the skills of the IT delivery partner and external advisors to succeed. How often have we heard that? Almost every project we've looked at. There is no doubt that th these problems are still coming to light, and as I touched on earlier, I'm expecting to report on at least another one or two projects over the, the coming months. Um, I think the challenge for us and for government is unpicking what are problems that are still current and what are things that are coming out of um, problems that were laid when these projects were started three and four years ago. My view is that, that for this programme, the problems originated back in 2012 and 2013 when it was first set up. The government has given to this committee a commitment that its new arrangements will make that much less likely to happen in future. It's too soon for me to say whether, whether those new arrangements are having the effect they're intended to have. I hope they do, but I can't give you that assurance yet. Can I, can I just ask a very you quick can. supplementary? I mean, I, I appreciate uh, about the issue about the problem wasn't escalated up, but we have director generals in the Scottish Government who are effectively the chief executives of their departments. Uh, surely they should be monitoring personally um, or ensure that on their behalf a project of this size is being monitored. And while rightly this should have been escalated up at a much earlier stage, similarly surely the then Director General, had they been doing their job properly, should have picked up this problem much earlier than what it was when they did. You're absolutely right that there is a very clear system of accountability from the Permanent Secretary through the Director Generals and for outside bodies to the accountable officers for those bodies. Um, I think the, um, the challenge in this case seems to be whether the arrangements that were, that were in place to give the Director General the assurance he needed that the programme was um, progressing as planned worked properly and I think there's evidence that they didn't work well because of the governance problems that were there and we've also seen across IT systems across government and further afield that really strong sense of opt optimism bias that people hope it will all turn out okay and they pile the resources in and you can see evidence of that here with all due respect, surely any Director General worthy of the name and the salary shouldn't be relying always on escalation. They themselves should be making sure proactively that a project of this size is going to plan. Clearly that did not happen. So it seems to me, you know, the Chiefs have something to answer for here as well as the people who are on the, the uh, ground floor as it were. Certainly accountable to Parliament for their use of public money. There's no question about it. And I think... 
I, I put a slight distinction, Mr. Neil, between them sort of seeking out evidence of progress and putting in place arrangements that give them the assurance they require. They, they should be um, absolutely accountable for having a system in place that gives them accurate, reliable, fair information about progress, which is a basis for them then to dig down when problems arise. That clearly didn't happen in this case, and they are accountable for that. It's the nature of the accountable officer role. Just in the answer to Monica Lennon earlier on, you talked of the contractor staff uh, and knowledge transfer and that sort of thing. Do you know, has the Scottish Government done any analysis on how the split comes between employment, employed individuals and contractor people uh, and done any risk assessment based on that, particularly in relation to the inevitable cost overruns that a contractor will now seek to pass on? Gemma, do you want to pick that up? Um, certainly. Um, we know that um, on this programme, the majority of, of um, staff were contractor staff. So we, you, there's an exhibit in the report that shows the high number of contractors um, working on, on it. Um, the contractors came through um, the main um, partner, CGI, um, but for the report makes a distinction that actually for the the calendar year of 2015, they were actually under the direction of the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government took accountability for um, IT delivery for, the, for that calendar year. So essentially, they were um, providing the direction to staff of how many staff they needed, what they wanted staff to do. They would simply ask CGI for those resources that they needed, and CGI would provide the staff, but they would be working under the direction of the Scottish Government at that time. In terms of the actual risk assessment, in terms of that knowledge transfer and what knowledge need, ne needs to be done, I think that forms part of the plan that the Auditor General referred to earlier in identifying exactly who are the key staff with the key knowledge, what needs to be passed over and when, and when are the critical points for that of when people will leave. But, but as there, um, the thank you for the answer, what about the, if we've got a contractor providing services, that contractor will presumably have provided against an initial spec that is now likely to be exceeded. And the contractor will not bear that cost without seeking to pass that cost on, won't it? The contract that was set up at the very start was not a fixed price contract, but it was one that would be developed as the EC regulations became clearer, but that and the specifications would be developed and therefore the contract was uh, made on that basis. Um, as I referred to earlier for actually for a the year of the, of the programme 2015, the contract wasn't operating as it was intended, it wasn't operating as a partnership agreement as the Scottish Government had taken accountability for IT delivery. You're absolutely right about the broader point, Mr Kerr. In Exhibit 10 of the report, we show the number of contractors who are being employed at the rate that was set in the original framework contract, those who were at discounted rates and those who were at rates above those set out in the framework, um, and very significant numbers were being paid at above the framework rates, simply because um, within the style of contract that had been put together and the urgency of having a programme that's up and running, there was no alternative to having uh, the staff available and market conditions shift um, from month to month as we go through. Um, in, in many ways, it's not surprising to have a contract which isn't a fixed price at the beginning of a large and complex programme like this. We've seen it elsewhere. But if you do have a programme which is designed to flex as the requirements become clearer, you need to be very clear about how the changes will be managed. And what we didn't see was that evidence of a clear challenge about the number and type of staff being used and how much they were costing. Um, and those are the sorts of governance problems that we set out in the report. Alison Harris. Yeah, just, could I just come back to something that I picked up, I think, when, you were, when Mark Taylor was speaking regarding the loans. Now... Do, is there any indication of the level of loans that have actually been issued to these farmers? And from that, you know, what has been done really to assess the risk? Because it, did I understand that if the, if the payments aren't actually made, well, the, the, pay, the payments were made to the farmers to help them be, with the loans because they didn't get their payments, but if they don't actually get paid at the end of the day, what happens to those loans and where has this been brought into things? Do we have an idea of how much you know, that could be? You know, if they don't repay, what, you know, if they don't get the money? 
So, so we have a we have a summary of the the the, the loans that have been made in paragraph 51 on page 20 yes, through Thank to you. 53 on on 21. Right. I think the main thrust of that you'll see at 52, and this is the position at the end of April uh, 2016 that 5,119 loans may were made to individual farmers and crofters, and uh, those were worth around 91 million pounds at that point. Uh, the government would be best placed to give you an update uh, update from them. What happens if? Uh, from, from there is that the expectation is that individual farmers are paid at some point and at the point at which they are paid they're able to repay pay those loans. So that's based on an expectation that they will be because 91 million is quite a substantial sum so 91 million we're hoping that they will be paid and the loans will be yep. so refunded to the government or repaid yep. to the government. So, so at the point that, that individual mm -hmm. farmers are able to receive uh, a payment equivalent to their to their loan, uh, the expectation is that those loans will be repaid from that payment. Okay, and there's no, no what provision has been put in in case of, you know, farmers not making the loan repayments? Is there? So, so we, so we, hi so we highlight in the report there are risks uh, to the government. Therefore, a yep. potentially calculated yep. one yet. Yep. So, and and one of the things it's worth highlighting is currently we're auditing the accounts of the Scottish government for the year ended 31st of March 2016, and those sort of questions are very much the questions that we're exploring with government about how they account for uh, their expenditure during the year and the balances, the loan balances, and other balances that they have at the end of the year. I think I was maybe more thinking of the farmers' accounts, you know, they could, what might happen to them in the, the longer run if they're not here a year or two years from now, you know, where this loan is repaid. Thank you. That's fine. Thank okay, you. Um, I'm going to pick up on a couple of issues um, myself. I wanted to take um, you back to something we talked about right at the start. I think the Auditor General admitted that uh, problems with IT projects in response to Mr Beatty are not uh, confined to Scotland. Um, obviously, these cap payments need to be made right across the European Union in all member states, and all member states have very different requirements in terms of their rural economy. But has there been any learning that you've come across from the IT systems in other member states and how and how this is done in other member states that, that could have been perhaps learned for or has the Scottish Government already been looking to other member states to, to learn lessons from there? One of the challenges with this is that although all member states are entitled to apply for funding under the common agricultural policy, they're not all starting in the same place. Um, so, for example, members might recall um, significant problems in England with the Rural Payments Agency under the last CAP programme, um, which uh, caused problems to the rural economy there. Um, at that point, Scotland's payments proceeded much more smoothly. This time round, it looks as though, and I stress it looks as though, payments in England are going more smoothly and Scotland is having more problems. My hunch is that one of the reasons for that is that um, England did some of the difficult things then around land mapping and around having uh, much more of the process digitised for the last programme than Scotland now does for the new programme. Um, having said that, th there's also um, differences in the schemes themselves that have been agreed. So in Scotland, um, after discussions with farmers, the Scottish Government agreed to um, two additional schemes for um, sheep and uh, beef, for example, in Scotland. They also added a third category for land payments, all of which are designed to reflect Scottish circumstances, but also make the system more complex. So there is a limit to how much learning there can be between member states. Um, Mark is closer to this than I am and might be able to give you a, a sense of exactly how that learning has played out in practice. I think, I think all, all I can do is really emphasise the point about different contexts and different, and different places and very much how much that influences uh, the extent to which experiences can be shared. The other little detail that's probably worth sharing is, is that one of the things that the Scottish Government considered was using a system that was in operation in a number of other countries as not quite an off-the-shelf option, but as an alternative option to building their own system from scratch. Ultimately, they ruled that out. We highlight some delays around decisions around what, what we call a contingency option in, in in, in, the, in the, the report, I think that emphasises, the decision they took there emphasises that, that very much the context is different in different places, uh, both in terms of the detail and the way in which the, individual, the, the overall principles of the schemes are implemented in individual bodies and what their starting point is. Okay, thank you. Um, the second point I'd like to pick up on was, um, we've rehearsed a bit this morning, but it's about this escalation and responsibility and 
accountability. Now, I, th I think it was Alec Neil who said that this issue didn't come before the Scottish Cabinet until just last October, October 2015. But I think Mark Taylor in one of his responses said that it was on the risk register with the Scottish Government in uh, February uh, 2013, which is uh, quite a long time ago now. Um, at what point are um, ministers brought into this? You know, we, we've talked this morning about, you know, Alec Neil talked about the Director General having to be responsible for this. I'm not under any illusion that the previous Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, spent a lot of time with farmers in Scotland over the last few years and was well aware of the issues with this system. So, you know, in terms of accountability, um, if this was on the risk register with the Scottish Government, should there not have been much earlier ministerial involvement and asking for briefings? and updates on how the project was progressing? There is, there's no question that ministers are responsible for setting policy and civil servants deliver that policy on their behalf. Now, government is a big and complex thing with a whole range of um, policy priorities um, to be delivered across the whole programme for government. Um, and as, Mar as Marcus said, at an early stage, it was identified that this programme was complex, has significant risks associated with it, both in terms of the costs and the impact on farmers and the rural economy, and it was included on the Scottish Government's risk register for that reason. One of the things that we as auditors look at in any body that we audit is how well those risk um, management arrangements are working. It's not enough just to capture the risk and then carry on with business as usual. There has to be an another step which says, how do we know what's really happening here? Now, the way in which any accountable officer um, aims to exercise that accountability is by having a system in place whereby people know what they're responsible for. Those people within the organisation are monitoring good, robust, reliable and fair, balanced information about costs and progress and, and where the risks currently are and understand when they should be escalating those to their manager, to the Director General, to the Permanent Secretary and to Ministers. Our view, I think, on this one is that because the governance arrangements didn't work as they were planned to, because decisions were being taken outside the programme board, because some decisions were being delayed, because of those tensions between the programme team and the IT team, with information not being passed on properly, those arrangements didn't work as well as they needed to. And I think that's the area that would be worth the committee exploring with government at an appropriate point. And it's certainly, as Gemma has said, um, something where we're thinking, how can we help people to apply them better in complex situations like this, particularly, I think, around the, the role of the non-executive directors who, um, who feel they weren't necessarily in a position to understand what progress was being made and where they should be applying the challenge that's at the heart of their role. Is there anything you two want to add to that, Gemma? No. I, th I think the, the, the one, one bit of detail I would add is around, I think it would be wrong to character, characterise this project as one where things were going wrong locally and nobody at the top knew what was happening uh, within government, uh, within the civil service, uh, and that there was awareness, and that's inf uh, illustrated by the, the inclusion of it on the strategic risk register of the organisation. There was awareness and there was an escalation process that made it clear that there were issues here emerging. I think Caroline's talked talk before about optimism bias. I think that was one of the reasons that, you know, in raising an issue and raising a risk and saying there's a problem here and we're dealing with it and this is how we're dealing with it, inevitably people are uh, uh, open to the suggestion that it's able to be fixed. The other thing I'd add here is that one of the things that was evident throughout this project, we've, we've, the, the Auditor General's touched on how the project was constructed at the start, but the other thing that was evident throughout is that the priority, the pressure within the project was to get payments made to farmers, and we understand why that was. And there was a tension between that and making sure the systems were in place, making sure that uh, teams worked well together, and making sure that uh, the... the, the, the the, the approach was sustainable in the longer term. And what we highlight in a number of places throughout the report is what the effects of that were. We're not suggesting for a moment it's not important to get payments out to farmers, of course it is, but that pressure on the team and that pressure on the organisation throughout made it very difficult to get out of the here and now, to raise their heads and get on to the, and how is this going to move forward in the future? Given the experience that Mr Beattie referred to with other public sector IT projects such as NHS 24, was 50 million uh, too low an estimate of how much this project was going to cost? That was the original Scottish Government estimate. 
I mean, with hindsight, clearly it was, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, I think the the what's very difficult to untangle is how much of the current projected cost of 178 million has arisen because of the the delays and problems that have been. Um, encountered along the way. Um, Mark touched a moment ago on one of the things we say in the report, that the, the original decision about the route to take back in 2012 took too long. At that point, there were other options, like buying an almost off-the-shelf system that's used by other EU member states. Um, there was the option to, to design and build their own system. Other options were available, but the time taken to make that decision meant that effectively the only, the only decision left on the table at the point the decision was made was the, the one to design and build their own system. System. Now, I don't have a crystal ball that lets me say what it would have cost had they chosen one of the other options, but some of those options were ruled out just because of the time taken. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that the 178 million cost is at least in part because of the delays in making those early decisions in getting this, the right skills in place and the consequences of that over the last four years. One final question. You've referred a couple of times, Auditor General, to the skills shortage. Uh, is this something you've identified in the other IT projects? And can you give us a flavour of the extent of the IT skills shortage in Scotland? Yes, um, I think there are, there are two dimensions to this. First of all, you're absolutely right. It's something we have referred to both in other um, reports on IT systems that have failed, and Mr Beattie referred to NHS 24. There have been some other smaller scale ones. Um, I, I would say there are there are two dimensions to it. First of all, across Scotland, we don't have the number of highly skilled IT professionals we do, not just for the public sector, but for private businesses and the wider economy. And that's a, a recognised priority within the government's economic strategy that needs to be taken forward. Secondly, though, and very specifically, I think within public sector projects, one of the recurring problems we've seen is a failure to get the really good commercial and programme skills in place right at the beginning that let the government or NHS 20 or another public body manage the project very tightly themselves rather than being held hostage by very skilled um, private companies uh, who, who specialise in negotiating contracts and delivering. It's why we think the government's um, commitment to developing a very highly skilled government digital service is the right way forward to do that once for Scotland and to be able to invest in getting the really highest level skills there for all public bodies to use. It is too early for us to say whether that commitment is actually having the intended benefits in practice. Can I thank you very much indeed, all of you, for your evidence today. I'm now going to suspend for a couple of minutes while Audit Scotland witnesses swap over for the next item. Thank you.
Okay, item three on the committee's agenda is the Auditor General for Scotland report on changing models of health and social care. Um, the Auditor General is staying with us for this item. I also welcome from Audit Scotland, Carol Calder, Gillian Matthew and Anthony Clark, Assistant Director. As before, I invite the Auditor General for Scotland to make her opening statement before I open up to questions from members. Thank you, Convener. This report on changing models of health and social care assesses how NHS boards, councils and partnerships are transforming the services they deliver to meet the changing needs of the population. It also considers some of the challenges to delivering the Scottish Government's 2020 vision of enabling everyone to live longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting by 2020, and the actions required to address these challenges. In this report, we've taken a strong focus on supporting learning and improvement by providing examples of the kinds of services that are being developed and the kinds of things that need to be done to make that transformation and increase the pace of change. It's obviously vitally important that people are able to receive effective care when they need it, at home or in a homely setting if possible. It's also important that people have a say in the care they receive. The Government's 2020 vision aims to do this, but the shift to new models of care is not happening fast enough to meet the growing need, and the new models of care that are in place are generally small scale and not widespread. The committee will know that health and social care services are facing increasing pressures from an ageing population and a tightening financial position. We've reported on this previously. In this report, we provide more detail about some of those pressures, including the growing pressures in general practice and increasing emergency admissions to hospital, particularly for people aged 85 and over. Those pressures on health and social care services are likely to continue to increase over the next 15 years and more. For example, if the population increases as predicted and services continue to be delivered in the same way, our analysis suggests that by 2030, compared to 2013, there could be an extra 1.9 million GP appointments and 1.5 million practice nurse appointments, an extra 20,000 home care clients and 12,000 more long-stay care home residents, and 87,000 more emergency admissions to hospital with an extra 1.1 million additional bed days. It's clear that our existing services can't continue as they are, and health and social care services will need to be delivered differently to cope with those increasing pressures. I want to be very clear that new approaches to health and care are being developed in parts of Scotland. We've summarised these in Exhibit 6 on pages 20 and 21 of the report, and we've given more detail on particular examples in a supplement to the report that you should have. Those emerging models are generally designed to prevent admissions to hospital or to get people home from hospital more quickly. For example, NHS Tayside is providing enhanced community care to elderly people who are at risk of admission to hospital, and GP practices in Govan are trying out new approaches to patient care in one of the most deprived areas of Scotland. Several partnership areas are making good use of data to understand the needs of their local population and how services are currently being used. Good examples include, include Perth and Kinross, Western Bartonshire and East Lothian. Those partnerships are using this information to look at how services can be provided more effectively and closer to people's homes. At the same time, ISD Scotland is developing a database of linked health and social care data and their analysts are working in each partnership area to provide expertise and advice. But I think that more needs to be done to make the transformational change required. NHS boards and councils will need to work with the new integration authorities to develop and adopt innovative ways of working that are quite different from traditional services. And this will involve making difficult decisions about changing, reducing or cutting some services in order to invest in others. It will also require a significant shift in how all of us across Scotland access, use and receive our services. The government needs to provide stronger leadership in making that change by developing a clear framework to guide local development and consolidating evidence of what works. It could also do more to help to remove some of the barriers facing NHS boards and councils by identifying longer term funding to allow bodies to develop sustainable new care and by identifying a mechanism for shifting resources from hospital to community services. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I are here to answer the committee's questions. General. Can I open up to questions now? I'm going to take Monica Lennon first. Thank you, Convener, and I draw committee's attention to my entry in the Register of Members' Interest as a, an elected member at South Lanarkshire Council. Uh, thank you, Auditor General. I 
First of all, I want to address one of the points in the report and the, the focus on short-term funding and, and the impact that that's having on service delivery. We see an increasing use of um, reliance on the private sector to help meet targets, and it's clear that that's not demonstrating value for money. Um, what I'm wondering is, is that a, a trend that you see continuing? Uh, and if not, if that's not inevitable, what steps need to be taken to reduce that reliance on the private sector? Um, it's a, a very good question, and there's a lot in there. If you'll forgive me, I'll just pull back a little bit. Um, in my reports over the last three or four years, I have highlighted that the focus on targets that you refer to has clearly had some real benefits in bringing down the times that people wait for um, elective care, for admission to A&E, and other things that matter to all of us. But at the same time, they've tended to, to drive attention towards what's happening in acute hospitals rather than what's happening in the health and care system as a whole. And there's a real risk that they can make it more difficult to develop the sorts of systems that would prevent people being admitted to hospital by providing some of the care they need at home or much closer to their homes. Um, so I've uh, recommended on a number of occasions that that focus on targets should be reviewed and I'm delighted to see that the Cabinet Secretary has announced a review of them quite recently. Um, and I think as part of that wider view of what the system needs to do. Um, so I think that the targets themselves need to be seen as part of the system rather than in isolation. The other part of the recommendation that I make that you referred to is for longer term financial planning and longer term streams of funding. At the moment it's not clear that the government knows that the shift it wants to see can be achieved within the funding that's available for the NHS and for care services over the life of this parliament. Um, it's clear that there has been additional investment made and I set out the figures in the report. Um, the government has in the past been committed to protecting spending on the health service um, but we don't know that that's enough to make this shift. So there's both a need to model what the, the costs of a new model of care would look like and to make sure that the funding that's in place is there for long enough to let local services right across Scotland plan for what's happening. We've seen an additional £30 million worth of funding announced for this year in the budget. We've seen over a four-year pe period quite recently a £300 million change fund. But my reporting on that change fund has been that it's often used for quite um, small-scale and time-limited um, projects which do have an impact locally but don't shift the whole system. And it's that bigger picture, the system-wide planning and longer-term financial planning that I think is needed to really transform services. And thank you for that. Um, I also note that I think seeing the case studies is, is quite useful to see that there, are, there is some good practice out there already. Um, but you know, my attention is drawn to the fact that some councils and NHS boards are finding it very difficult to, to agree on budgets for the new integration authorities. And you know, I think we have to look at that in the context of real term reductions in both NHS and council budgets. To, to what extent do you feel that that is, is, is making it difficult for councils and, and NHS boards to, to reach agreement? Um, and, and do you see any examples across the country where you know, they're making more progress than others? Um, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that it is harder to um, set up new ways of delivering services, which is what integration authorities are intended to do at a time when budgets are under pressure rather than when they're growing, um, and, and that will be more difficult. We reported on the new integration authorities' progress with setting them up back in December of this year, um, and found then that there were some real risks to their ability um, to deliver what they're expected to do. We're carrying out some more work now which is looking at progress now they're formally up and running as at the 1st of April and Anthony might be able to give us a bit more information about what we know about that without preempting the follow-up reporting we'll be doing. We're at the relatively early stages of planning the next phase of our audit work on health and social care integration but what we'll be doing is assessing how well the, the governance arrangements are actually leading to shifts in services. When we reported last time, we were very focused on how well the integration authorities are putting in place the structures and processes they need to plan together. The focus looking forward will be, is it actually making a difference? Um, we know there have been some delays in agreeing budgets in some health and social care partnerships, but that's not universal across Scotland. Some places have been able to agree their budgets relatively easily. I think it really depends to an extent on the quality of the relationships that they have in place that they developed over time. Thank you. Um, so last point for now. I also note in, in the report, um, at this stage, it's still 
there's still a lack of evidence in, in terms of impact and outcomes for service users, which is really the most important uh, aspect of all of this. What improvements do you feel need to be made in terms of local accountability and scrutiny? I mean, I know in the report that it's very difficult um, to carry out you know, extensive cost-benefit analysis because there appears to be a lack of local cost information. What steps are being taken to address that and what more can the Scottish Government do in, in that regard? I think that's one of the big recommendations from this report is that um, the government, for reasons I entirely understand, is encouraging local areas to find their own solutions. Um, every population, every community is different. The services that are currently in place differ from place to place. The um, skills and experience that professional staff and community groups are bringing are different. So this absolutely isn't about a cookie cutter approach where we try and do the same thing right across Scotland. Equally, though, there's a real risk that the approach that um, lets a thousand flowers bloom, that people are trying different things in different parts of Scotland um, without uh, the sort of support and guidance that we're asking for here. Some things work, some things don't, and we never really know what made the difference. What, what was it that made the ones that were successful work in practice? What went wrong with the ones that didn't? And we're certainly not seeing the overall shift to services that we need to. Um, if I can draw your attention briefly to Exhibit 8 on page 27, we show the amount spent on acute hospitals against the amount spent on um, community and social care services over the four years between 2010 and 2014, when the 2020 vision was first launched. Um, and there's really no shift over that time at all. And, and that is a, a sort of a stark reminder, I think, that for all the good work that's going on, we're still very heavily reliant on acute services and we're not getting that shift happening locally. What we'd like to see, and we have a checklist in the report that the team will be able to point me towards, is as people are setting up their projects, much better support for them in saying, how, how will we measure whether this is working? How will we learn from that? How can we spread that across our area and across Scotland? so that that investment is really having the biggest possible payoff that it can. Um, we think that's the counterbalance to the government's focus on outcomes. The outcomes approach is very widely celebrated, not just in Scotland, but further afield. But alongside the outcomes, you need to have a plan and you need to know what progress is being made. And we think that's the bit that's missing at a local level that the government can be helping to push forward. It's exhibit nine on page 30, I think, for, for the record. It sets out what we think should be in place when people are planning and delivering their um, local services. Thank you. Thank you. Colin. Thank you, Peter. Um, General, I think I detect a subtle change in the way this report came forward. Um, I welcome the fact that there's, there's a, a focus on success stories and on uh, on uh, alternative models that are being attempted up and down the country. I think that's really helpful. And I think it's really helpful uh, as a indicator that uh, people are experimenting with new, these new models and possibly they might get some transfer of good practice there. So I think that's really positive. We're always delighted to be called subtle. It's not our <laughs> usual image. Um, and we are, we are trying here genuinely to um, be helpful to fill that gap by using our um, insight across Scotland to look at what's working and to look at what's needed to, to make that much more widespread. I'm just looking at uh, page 8, um, paragraph 5 there. I'm looking at the, the evidence, how you gathered the evidence here. And we've talked previously ad nauseum in this committee about the, the problems with the figures that are being produced nationally, the fact that, uh, you know, the, while well, the situation's improving, it's a big beast to start to get uh, accurate information from in order that we can use that usefully going forward. And you say you gathered evidence by analysing national and local information which helped you identify pressures in the system. You carried out projection analysis. You conducted desk-based research. And you work closely with one partnership area. Sounds a bit narrow. Um, I'll ask Gillian to talk you through how we did this work. I, I can see that list might look narrow. I think in many ways, reflecting that slightly different approach you focused on, this was a much more outward-looking uh, piece of work than many we have done in the past because we did want to get that grassroots perspective. Gillian, do you want to give a flavour of that? 
Um, yeah, just to say a bit more about the approach, um, we we obviously liaised quite closely with um, colleagues across the government um, in different strands, that you know, around primary care, um, secondary care, the improvement side of things as well. So we were drawn on what the knowledge that was already there and examples that they were aware of. As part of um, when we started the audit, we wrote out to all of the um, boards and councils across Scotland. Um, to ask you know, what kind of things were, were going on there, this is the audit we're doing, what kind of things can you help um, point us to any good practice they wanted to share. And then um, we did visit, we didn't um, go to every area in Scotland and we didn't look at every, um, you know, different types of models that were going on, but we tried to get a really good range of what was going on, but we were really pushing across various networks um, through ISD as well, because they're doing a lot of um, close work with different boards around helping them understand their data and what's going on around services. So we were really putting the feelers out quite widely to try and um, find out where there was good practice. I think that's where we were um, struggling to find a lot of the you know, widespread practice, but we were trying to draw on these, as Caroline said, the different examples to try and demonstrate the different types of things that were going on um, and around um, trying to highlight where some of the challenges are and the types of things that, that different bodies are doing to overcome those, to try and be helpful around the different things that can be, uh, different approaches that can be taken. Okay. Uh, as our general said, it just seems we look to be a bit narrow on the surface when you, when you look at that. Looking at the overall report, I mean, it's, it's very similar to previous reports we've got, actually, progress being made, but not fast enough and, uh, you know, not, not all at the same pace. One theme that I get through this and is, is in connection with the question of leadership, both at a local level and at a national level. Now, obviously, the Scottish Government has kind of left a lot of it locally to suit local needs, so they will develop along the broad guidelines and along the broad path that everybody's following. They will, they will develop what is necessary locally. You seem to be indicating here from the fact that you want the Scottish Government to provide more leadership in various areas, that perhaps a more centralised approach would be more effective, which is it's not the way it's been done, but is that is that really what you're trying to get across? I wouldn't use the word centralised at all, Mr Beatty, as I said in response to Ms Lennon's question. I think what we're not looking for is a sort of cookie-cutter approach that pretends that each part of Scotland is the same and the same model of care will work there. That's obviously not the case. Um, I think we've got two concerns. One, the vision is very clear, and it's been in place since 2011. Progress towards it is very slow. I pointed Ms Lennon towards the exhibit that shows the, the balance of spend between hospital care and community and social care services really hasn't shifted over the four years after 2011. Um, and there's a lot of support activity happening. We list the joint improvement team, the Quest team, the work that ISD does, some of the others in the report, but it feels to us that that's quite uncoordinated and it's hard for local services to get good information about what's being tried elsewhere and what it is that, that makes a successful um, change programme work. So what we're looking for, I think, is something which takes the vision and then provides a framework for local, local partnerships, local services, to know what um, the vision looks like in practice, helps them work through what it looks like in their areas, helps them do the financial modelling and the financial planning. Um, it might be useful to draw an analogy with what we've seen in relation to the government's priority on educational attainment quite recently, where we saw the Deputy First Minister yesterday announcing a plan for taking the, that very clear outcomes focus on attainment, but a plan for how um, Education Scotland um, and the SQA will work with schools and local authorities to move people people in that direction, using different approaches in different areas, but still a clear plan for what will happen. I think we're talking about something similar here, not micromanagement or centralised control, but clearer, more aligned support between the outcome and the plans locally. Coming back to information, um, on page 14, paragraph 20, you're talking about, in, about quite a big gap in information here. How much how good is actually the information that the government and the local authorities and so on are working on in relation to this? Is it robust or are there real gaps that are causing them uh, uh, problems, delays, issues? 
The gap you refer to there on um, page 14 is specifically about um, a lack of information about GPs and primary care, and I'll ask Gillian to expand on that in a moment. Um, I think we have reported to this committee in previous sessions that in Scotland we've got extremely good information about hospitals and acute care, probably among the best in the world. We've got much less information, though, about what's happening in communities, and given the very clear focus of the 2020 vision on people's homes and homely settings, that's a really important gap. Julian, do you want to build on that? Yeah, so around um, sort of primary care general practice data, there, as you pointed out, there is a, back, a big gap there, which did cause us some problems in trying to um, look at the, the scale of the issue around uh, that area and the you know, demand for um, general practice services. But we did pull together various bits of information in Exhibit 5, um, which is the infographic around um, the pressures around general practice. So there is other information there that we can draw on, but it's not, you know, it's not all the information that we'd like to see and that would be helpful, obviously, locally um, for boards and partnerships to use. The there was that... Uh, you know, this is an example. Other other areas where there are big gaps, and Lord General mentioned about local information, uh, perhaps not being as robust as information from hospitals, which obviously has been well honed over the last few years. Do we still have major gaps in information locally that are causing problems with this integration? The gap around GPs and primary care is probably the most significant, partly because information that was collected until about 2012 isn't now collected. There are plans for new information, but it's not fully in place yet. And partly because under the new clinical strategy, GPs and primary care are seen as being at, at the heart of making this shift. Um, so we know there are pressures on general practice, which we set out in the report, but we don't currently have good information about how many GPs there are, how many hours they work, how that matches to the needs of the population, some really quite basic stuff that would let you invest in GPs in the right way and get the new GP contract negotiated in ways that lets GPs play the role that they're expected to play in, in the new clinical strategy. Um, I have Liam next. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the report, which I found very clear and accessible. Um, just because we were on the point of GPs, you, you did mention that the <coughs> pressure is likely to increase over the next 15 years. Uh, by 2030, I think you said there were an extra 1.9 million GP appointments. Uh, and the strategy is all about preventing admissions to hospital, or at least in, in major part. Now, obviously, what we've got here is a very people-intensive industry. Uh, and uh, you give a clear infographic on GP pressures. Uh, you talk about, at page 37, really where I'm going with this is what is going to be done about the shortage in GPs? Uh, particularly, uh, I note at page 37, uh, you talk about two and a half million is being allocated to explore the issues. Uh, now, do I take from that that the work of recruitment and retention has not, it is not ongoing yet? We're still at the stage of exploring what the problem is. Uh, not quite. Um, GPs are an unusual part of the public service workforce because almost all of them are independent contractors. They're contracted to NHS boards to provide general medical services. Um, and that means that um, the government, the health service, isn't in a position to plan the workforce and recruit them in quite the way it can for hospital doctors, for nurses and so on. Um, as you say, we have um, got an exhibit in the report which aims to show the pressures on uh, the, the GP workforce, and it's very clear those pressures are significant and are getting worse, partly because of demographic changes, um, with uh, GPs expressing concern about the workload, at the same time as we're seeing an increase in women GPs and men GPs looking for a better work-life balance around it. Um, the Government, I think, would be better placed to answer your question about how the 2.5 million is being used. I think they would also say that probably the bigger contribution to resolving that problem is the new GP contract that's being negotiated at the moment, which will um, really review fundamentally the terms on which GPs are providing general medical services, um, the ways they work and the ways they're paid for that. And the hope is that that will both improve recruitment and retention, but also enable them to play a, a really central part in the new clinical strategy. Strategy. Do you want to add anything to that, Julian? Yeah. Just on that, the, the new GP contract then, do you anticipate or do you see evidence, obviously, other jurisdictions have had 
difficulties with GP contracts. Do you see anything in the pipeline that gives cause for concern? Um, I, auditors are not in the business of speculating, as you would expect. Um, we are keeping a close eye on both the government's policy commitments and the progress that's being made. At this point, I think it's too soon to say um, what outcome will be achieved, but it is something we'll keep our audit work focused on um, over the period up to the agreement of the contract and then as it comes into effect in the years at the end of the decade. Um, so, finally, the, the only other thing just... Uh, as I say, I found your report very interesting, uh, and particularly just at page 19 you talked about the new care models being introduced uh, and said there was a lack of evidence about impact, implementation costs, efficiency gains or cash savings or outcomes. Uh, but then at page 28, uh, it talks about a lack of a clear framework of how the government expects the NHS boards and councils to achieve the areas for action, and there are no clear measures of success. And then on the previous page, we talk about uh, the Scottish government announced plans to go to a new national conversation on the future of healthcare in Scotland. What I take from that is that the government almost seems to be saying to people, or uh, to organise organizations on the ground look here's the intention but we're not going to tell you what success looks like or indeed how to achieve it uh, and now actually we're going back into a national conversation on what's actually going to happen is that a fair summary i don't think it's quite um the uh the conclusion that we've drawn in looking at this area. I think the starting point is that there is a very clear vision for 2020, which is, as we say in the report, widely accepted and, and recognised as being the right way forward. Um, we, we have a government which has, has taken an outcomes approach to its overall set of priorities, um, which again is recognised as being an effective way of focusing on what's most important rather than on short-term measures or inputs and outputs. Um, but that given the scale of the challenge here, both in terms of the growing population and the needs we'll all have as we get older and the financial pressures that um, are in place on public services, there's a need for something between that vision and what individual partnerships, health boards, councils are doing on the ground. Um, I think I said in, in response to Mr Neil's question earlier um, that we've seen a shift very recently in relation to education with a national delivery plan between the outcome and what schools and local authorities are doing. My sense is that we need something similar in relation to the health and social care vision, not to micromanage it or centrally control it, but to give people more support in thinking through how they go about deciding what's best in their area, how they do the long-term financial planning, how they measure whether they're, moving, whether they're moving in the right direction. Alec Neal. Thank you. Thank you. Can I first of all convene, uh, just since it's less than two years since I was the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, uh, just uh, declare that interest. Uh, can I first of all just uh, pick up the point that Monica Lennon made, uh, for example, in uh, South Lanarkshire, and it's a very good example of what's happening elsewhere, where there is uh, progress is being slowed by, if I can put it like this, haggling between the health board and the council about the budgets for the partnerships. Uh, and that is going on, I think, right across the country and defeats the purpose, uh, one of the major purposes of having the partnerships in the first place. So is it not time for us to consider at a national level, instead of having the health side or funding of the partnerships come through the current route, which is Scottish Government to Health Board, Health Board through negotiation to the partnership, and the social care budget going government to local government settlement to social care part of the lo each local authority's budget to negotiation with the partnership, would it not now make more sense to de help deal with some of the problems that you've identified for the Scottish Government uh, to actually directly allocate a health and social care budget to each partnership uh, and then the residue on the health side goes to the health boards and the, uh, the rest of the local government settlement excluding social care goes to local authorities but for the government actually to allocate a health and social care budget to each partnership directly. 
The legislation gov governing my role very explicitly precludes me from commenting on the merits of policy. Um, that, that's government's job. I'm here to look at how it's implemented. Having said that, I think in this report and the report we published on health and social care integration at the end of 2015, we have said how complex some of those arrangements are. Um, and I'm conscious that this committee um, is likely to take on a role in post-legislative -legislative scrutiny. If the committee wanted to look at the implementation of the legislation that set up the integration authorities, I think we're very well placed to support you with the range of work we've done in that area. Can I suggest that when we look at our work programme later, perhaps we look at that uh, offer, please? Yes. I think it's a very interesting idea, and I think it's something that the committee should should certainly look at. So we'll take up that offer from the Auditor General. Do you have any further yes, questions, Mr. Neil? Continue. It's in two areas. Um, again, identifying where the slowness of progress is being made. Uh, it seems to me that one of those areas of slowness is the inability of the social care sector to deal with the additional demand that would come from reducing the number of people who are hospitalised. As we know, about one third of all the people in Scottish hospitals at any one time don't actually need to be there. And the reason they are there is because of the lack of social care provision in their community. And it seems to me that um, with the introduction of the living wage from the 1st of October throughout the social care sector, um, that perhaps we need to put a bit more emphasis and oomph uh, behind further improvements in the social care sector to be able to absorb the capacity. A major problem, of course, is recruitment and retention. But it's not just about the living wage. Uh, all the evidence shows that the major problem is actually a lack of a career structure in social care. Uh, do we not really now need to put our foot much more on the accelerator in terms of further improvement to the social care sector, including proper funding of care providers, which, quite frankly, we've admitted in a joint statement with COSLA two years ago needed to be dramatically improved in order to deal with those challenges in social care? And similarly, in parallel, uh, the community health hubs, which are based on the Alaskan model, where they de-hospitalise to a massive extent, um, we need really to put our foot on the accelerator on that as well. And if we did both of those things across the country, would that not may have a major impact on how quickly we can realise this 2020 vision? I think there's no doubt we do need to invest in transforming social care in the same way that I think the health service has been over-focused on the acute sector and on the acute targets, which have made it more difficult to think about the wider system. Social care services have been very bound up in getting people out of hospital as quickly as possible, rather than being able to pull back and say, how do we keep people at home healthily as long as possible? Um, I, I'd, my only note of caution is that I think looking at either bit of that in isolation is not very helpful. What we need to do is to pull back and look at the system as a whole, and that's what the, the great examples in our report are tending to do, both here in Scotland and further afield, to really take a whole systems approach. And, the final question is, and I commissioned this, but it disappeared after the reshuffle, a strategic business plan, which is the, the connection between the vision and making it happen. And I think what you're saying is there's actually the need for the Scottish Government to produce a strategic business plan not just guidelines and frameworks and visions, but a strategic business plan as to how we can make it happen by 2020. I have spent a long time with this, this committee over the years arguing about what a business plan might mean and might not mean in relation to police reform and other things. I, I, I think what you're describing sounds like what we intend here by talking about a framework, by describing what the new models might look like, um, having a financial plan for it, and knowing what milestones and targets you would need to know if you're making progress. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Auditor General, you said that um, since 2012, information on general practitioners is not being collected. Um, given GP shortages now, what impact does that lack of information have on your ability to scrutinise general practice service and on uh, the government's ability to, um, f to forecast public spending on general practice? to do our work, but I think much more importantly is its impact on the government's ability to plan 
public spending, but also um, services. The new clinical strategy, which again is, has been very widely celebrated in the health and social care world, is absolutely based on GPs playing a much wider role in future, really being at the heart of services for all of us, with hospital being something which is only there where it's absolutely needed. To do that, we need enough GPs in the right places, appropriately skilled, feeling they're appropriately rewarded, not having the information to, to plan that and to think through the implications of the new GP contract is a drawback. There are plans in place to fill that gap, but as far as we know, it's still there at the moment. Gillian, do you want to add to the, the information question? Um, I think all we can say at the moment about the information is that there, there is a new system that ISD have been working on over the past few years um, uh, around filling that gap again, because it was through ISD that information was available up to 2013. Um, and but we don't know what that looks like yet and what kind of information is going to be available but I think um, it's due to be available in the next few months but we're still um, unclear exactly what it's going to look like and what kind of information is going to be available but we're keeping in touch with them around that. Do you know why the information was uh, ceased to be collected and this gap has occurred between collecting the information uh, which stopped in 2012 and this new, new information system coming online in the next few months? I think um, the system before, it was based on a sample of um, general practices across Scotland, so it, I think there was issues around how representative the information was. It was um, scaled up to estimate what the figures would be on a Scotland-wide basis, um, and I think there was issues around how the data was collected, so I think it was seen that it could be greatly improved, um, but unfortunately it was stopped while the new system's been implemented. So. That's why there hasn't been anything available for the last few years. It seems very worrying that at a time of GP crisis, we have a gap of information for four, for a total of, of four years. Um, so are you saying that we don't know how many GPs there are in Scotland and we don't know how many hours are being worked by general practitioners at the moment? We don't have good, good enough information about it. Um, we've used the information that is available, pulled it together, used estimates from surveys and other places to give you the information in our report. But in my view, as it says in the report, it, that's not strong enough information given the pressures we know currently exist and the central place of GPs in the new clinical strategy. Okay. Um, can I ask, we uh, have talked a bit this morning about the uh, IGB's budgets and it was reported in the press just a couple of months ago that they would not all be set by June. Obviously this report was published in March, but do you know if all of the integrated joint boards have now set their budgets? As, as far as we know they haven't, but I'll ask Anthony to update you on a, a position. Um, we don't have information across all 30, all 30 uh, one IJBs at the moment, it's something we'll be looking at as part of the next phase of audit work on health and social care integration. And as part of that work, we'll also be exploring the extent to which there have been delays in agreeing budgets between health and local government partners. We don't know if all the IGBs across Scotland have budgets set for the next year. I, I don't want to <coughs> give the committee misleading information. We know there have been problems from our audit work and the same press coverage that you've seen. We also have a concern that some places where budgets have been set, those budgets may not be um, realistic or fully agreed between the people who will have to deliver them. Uh, so I don't want to give you a headline figure that doesn't do justice to the complexity of the picture across Scotland. Oh, General, I was very uh, interested in the, in the part of your report where you talk about the... Um, um, we've rehearsed it already this morning about the balance between local provision and national guidance and strategy on health uh, and social care. I'm sure it's something the former cabinet secretary wrestled with himself. It was discussed uh, at length during the uh, election uh, process about that balance and uh, local accountability and different needs. And um, clearly your report, uh, you, you've really come down on the side saying there needs to be some national guidance in terms of outcomes, um, uh, what kind of framework or priorities, or I hesitate to use the word targets, but what, what kind of structure uh, would you see would be useful in that, in that, in terms of sustainability and equality of delivery across Scotland? Um, I think if we look at paragraphs 51 onwards, 
that's where we try to set out in the report um, what we think is needed. And again, I do want to stress we're not talking about centralised control or micromanagement, but about bridging the space between having a clear vision and what happens on the ground. So what um, we think would be really helpful for the government to clarify is, first of all, the immediate and the longer-term priorities that the partnerships should be focusing on. Um, and we've given some examples of the approaches that people are taking in the report. Many of them are around prevention, either short-term prevention, pr avoiding people needing to be admitted to hospital because there isn't a good community alternative in place, all the way back upstream to helping people stay active and healthy for longer so that they are less likely to need that as they get older. We've talked about a, a clear framework about the types of models that need to be tested. We've tried to categorise them into, I think, six categories here, some of which are those short-term um, prevention ones, some of which are population health models. Um, we, we've set that out in the exhibit at the centre of the report. A long-term funding strategy that gets a better estimate of how much money might be needed both in the long term to run this new overall health and social care system and what, if anything, is needed for double running or for investment in developing new services. And then finally, how the government will measure progress, what milestones it expects to see in place from things like the balance of spend between acute-based hospital services and community-based services through to shifts in the number of people being admitted to hospital, um, the number of people being um, looked after in care homes as opposed to in their own home the whole range of measures that would let you know whether you are making progress as planned towards the vision. Okay. We've had the 2020 vision for five years now that recommends the shift from acute to uh, community spend. Your report clearly identifies that that hasn't happened. Um, from, from your analysis, what are the pressures on government that is preventing them from making the shift that they want to make? Um, as well as the, the clarity of the um, support to local partnerships that we've just been talking about, I think there are a couple of um, clear clear barriers that get in the way. One is it's always harder to do this when funding is constrained rather than when it's growing. We had a decade at the beginning of this century when public services had huge amounts of investment. We're not in that position now and it's harder to make a shift when you're having to press down on costs across the piece. That's without doubt. Um, we touched earlier in response to Ms Lennon's question um, about the e effect that the acute targets have had on the health service. Um, uh, uh, all of us understand why those targets are there. Having um, quick and predictable access to acute care matters to us, but actually in the long term I think it matters much more to us to have good community-based services that will look after our parents and in not very long us as we get older and need that support at home. And we need to be shifting that conversation away from whether 12 hours wait, 12 weeks wait for elective surgery or four hours wait for A&E is right to something which is talking about the sort of care we want to be provided in communities across Scotland. Um, I think something else we touched on in the report that we haven't talked about today is a shift in the, the culture that all of us have in relation to the health service. Um, it's very easy for all of us to see a hospital, to recognise it, to have a, a real emotional attachment to it. It's where most of us were born and where parents have died and everything else. You can see a hospital. It's much harder to see some of the services we're talking about here um, and to recognise the good work that they're doing. And we haven't found a way yet of involving people right across Scotland in relation to the community empowerment agenda and the um, wider political debate that we have about why the vision is actually a much better way of providing health and social care than the things lots of us think about when we're thinking about the health service. So I'd pull out those three things, I think, as priorities, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, do my colleagues have any further questions for the Auditor General and her team? Colin. There was just one thing. Um, reference is made, and I hope I can find it, uh, on page 18, paragraph 27, to the Scottish Government working closely with 10 test sites over the next two years to offer support and guidance and share learning. Um, and we were touching on the fact that there was perhaps a need for the Scottish Government to be more involved across the board. Do we know the, the, the sort of dimensions of what the Scottish Government is going to be doing with these 10 test sites? Are they going to be uh, giving that level of guidance that you seem to be indicating in the report is required, or is it something totally different? I'll ask Gillian to talk you through what we know about the 10 test sites. I think um, when we were carrying out this, this audit, that was still at very early stages, and it wasn't entirely clear how 
what the role of the government was and how that was linking with those sites, uh, apart from that they were identified as 10 pilot sites to try out different um, ways of working. So we'll be picking that up with the government during this year um, as part of our annual overview of the NHS um, to find out the progress against those and what's coming out of, you know, what learning's coming out of those pilot sites as well. So this point, you actually know what this means? Not entirely, no, but we'll, we'll be picking that up with them this year. Okay. Uh, just a, a quick one, <coughs> and you'll forgive me because I'm just, just in the door, so uh, this may have been answered previously, but uh, the services and the levels of pressure that you're talking about in this report are a function of use. They're a function of people actually needing the services. Uh, more usage requires more funds at whatever level uh, it, it falls down to. Uh, so can you help me out? Is there any work being done on preventative measures such that people don't need to access the services at any level in the first place uh, that you can point me to? It's a, it's a really good question, and I think it comes back to the, my response to the convener's question earlier, that we talk about prevention in very broad terms, but actually it can operate in a whole range of ways. And many of the um, examples we talk about in this report are very narrowly about preventing particularly older people, frail older people, needing to be admitted to hospital um, when they have a fall or an infection or something. And that's obviously important, both because of the pressure it places on, health, on the health service, but also because it's not good care for most of those people themselves. Most of us don't want our parents to be in that position. But actually, we need to be thinking about this in, in, the, in the big sense, from how you avoid it at the point where somebody is frail and struggling to stay at home, how we build primary and community healthcare services that know who the people are who are at risk, who are hanging on now, but maybe are vulnerable um, to, uh, to winter and bad weather and colds and flus and so on, all the way back to how we keep whole populations more active and less likely to be falling into that category in 10 and 20 years' time. Now, there, there are projects um, involved looking at each of those sort of levels of prevention. What, it, what we're not seeing at the moment is that very strategic approach that Mr Neil was outlining that lets you plan what you intend to do, what the priorities are, how you might take some of the pressure off the system here to release resources you could invest further upstream. It's that strategic approach we're looking for. Can I thank uh, you very much for your evidence today, Auditor General and uh, team, we are now going to move into private session for the remainder of the meeting.